My name is Kim Brasser, and I am your host of One Voice Evolving Podcast, which drops every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. Today, our guest is Laurel Rutledge, your Chief Navigation Officer. She's not your average coach. She's your business and organizational strategy consultant and advisor with some super deep coaching mixed in. With a background in accounting, consulting, risk management, and HR across multiple industries, Laura is the secret sauce for successful business owners. Laurel is intent upon using her expertise to help women business owners, co-owners, step into their CEO energy and build the businesses and cultures they wish to work in. The key to success in Laurel's Alignment Vision Action Model, ABA, based on her nearly 30 years of corporate experience, is the framework for connecting strategies to intentional actions leading to expected outcomes. As her entrepreneur, individual, and corporate clients can attest, whether you're building a business, a career, or a life, Ava is the key. When she's not serving business owners and corporate leaders through retained strategic services, intensive, or customized programs, Laurel is working on the next iteration of her long-running podcast, which she just sunsetted after five years. You can still catch those in replay on podcast platforms everywhere and maybe throwing in some reading and attempts to work on her golf game in the mix. So Laurel believes that it's possible to operate in integrity with transparency and humility and run a successful business. She wants to help entrepreneurs do just that so that they can make an impact on their communities. By doing so, she is in service using her gifts to make an impact and create financial and time freedom for herself and her family as a result of exceptional service. Our time today was very friendly and informative, and you will love some of her references to mm, the root system of the trees uh, that portray our life. Today, specifically, we pulled back the curtain between her model of AVA and DEI initiatives in corporate spaces to talk about how they intersect and the difference between racial equity and racial equality and how that impacts the younger workforce and entrepreneurs who are small businesses working with big businesses. As always, enjoy our podcast. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and tell your friends and family. Hi, welcome. Welcome to One Voice Evolving Podcast, and our guest is Laurel Rutledge, and I'm going to ask her to tell you a little bit about herself just for a moment, and then we're going to talk about pulling back that curtain to see what, what it looks like in your field of expertise in DEI spaces today. Sure. So well, Laura thank you so much for having me, Kim. This is just a, an incredible honor. Um, I am Laurel Rutledge, your Chief Navigation Officer, and I spent nearly 30 years in corporate in everything from internal audit to my last job as the global head of HR strategy and analytics for a chemical company. And then I left uh, because I just could not stay anymore. And I started my own business consulting and advisory services firm. And I'm focusing mostly on women-owned professional services businesses, although I still do do some things in corporate, some executive coaching and some leadership training for new leaders, which I love. Uh, but, the, but the big thing that I really like to focus on in all of those spaces is no matter whether you're building a business, a career, or a life, it all comes down to strategy and people. And that's where my genius is. So how do I get you clear on your strategy so you can then put the right people around you? Because if you don't know where you're going, how do you know who needs to be on your team? I love that. Where I find that people struggle is in those um, crucial conversations, um, civil discourse yes. around triggering topics, and yeah. in DEI with all the shift that's been happening. Mm -hmm. What are you finding with your specifically the entrepreneurs that you work with? What are they? What are they experiencing? You know, what I'm finding a lot, because I work with women-owned businesses, and, and they're good-sized businesses, right? Um, they are focusing and having struggles mostly with generational issues. And it all comes down to many of these smaller firms, the folks that come to work for them, this may be their first role. 
They haven't been in a corporate space. They haven't been in a big company. They haven't been through all of the things that many of us went through. And so their lack of exposure to and experience with larger organizations makes it really hard for them to be discerning around what's reasonable and what's not. And that comes down to work, that comes down to pay, that comes down to benefits, that comes down to all the little things. Um, and so I'm finding my clients are really mostly struggling with that. And, and it's it's generational more than anything. I used to say, I'm from Las Vegas originally. Mm -hmm. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Right? But I realized when I went into corporate America, no, it doesn't. No. It goes you to, right to work with you. And it what does. happens at work goes home with you. Yeah. And so when I saw people interacting in the workplace, if they were the family hero at home, guess what role they like to play at work? Yeah. And if they were the scapegoat, if they were the quiet one who didn't make waves, they had a real hard time speaking yeah. out at yeah. work. And so when you say it's generational, I go back to those things we learn in childhood. You know, how yeah. do you move in this world? And how do you help them navigate a transition between any wounded child issues that could come up? Right. Or do you, or do you go that way? Do you go that deep? You know, I, I do. So I tell people I am a consultant and advisor with some deep coaching baked in, right? I do not lead with coaching because I think it's important to really understand what people are trying to do. And then you can talk about how they do that, right? It's the what, the focus is the what. And that's one of the things that underlies my alignment vision action model. So my model for my business is all about how do you get aligned with who you are and where you are? How do you get really clear on that vision of what you want? And then how do you move into empowered action? So who you are, where you are, what you want, and what it takes to get there. And that crosses over every single thing. So when I talk to some of the folks that are newer in their career, earlier in their career, I hear a lot about what they think they want aligned with, I will say, some interesting expectations of the workplace. So as you mentioned, you know, there may be the hero at home or there may be the quiet one at home and they think it's the same in the workplace. You know, I, from my perspective, business owners are running a business. That's why I encourage them not to say we want it to feel like family because I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> we, we've all been at that family dinner. This is not a family. This is a business. And it's the same thing with employees. It is not the employers responsible to make employees happy. That's a fallacy. You can't make anyone happy and happiness is fleeting. What you are responsible for is being very clear about how you value the skills that people bring, value them as individuals as well. That's really important. But creating an organization and an environment that values people, values the skills they bring is a safe environment, enables people to develop, enables them to grow, enables them to achieve some things they want to achieve within the bounds of the organization as it is set to achieve its objectives. And so I think the challenge from a DEI place, especially when we're talking generational, is this, this misunderstanding that the organization is supposed to give you everything that you want. They're supposed to pay you for you to live in a way in which you'd like to become accustomed. And that's just not true. And I think there gets to be a lot of emotional baggage tied up in a mismatch of expert expectations more than anything. Right. And maybe a mis a misfit between what they need and what the organization is aligned to do. Yes. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Now, do you do any work with the organization itself or are you working with the individual within the organization? It's both. So I have some clients where I'm just working with the leaders of the organization on their business, on their strategy, how they're setting up their organization. I have other clients where I do that and I'm doing some coaching or advising with individuals and individual leaders in their organization. So it's it depends on what the organization needs, but I do some of both. And so for you personally, what's your sweet spot? What do you love to do the most? I love working with these business owners, right? Here's, here's what I believe. I believe number one, when you're in service, prosperity comes. I believe that. I'm a servant leader. It's not about me. It's about my client. Number two, I also believe that when women make money, communities are changed, right? Lives are impacted. People are impacted. There's that old proverb that says, 
teach a man to fish and he feeds a family, teach a woman to fish and she feeds a community, right? And I truly believe that if I can help these women learn to continue to lead with their hearts, but act with their heads, the amount of money that we could begin to add to the GDP by women-owned businesses making as much as men-owned businesses, I think the last number I saw was like $3.2 trillion we could add to the GDP. And I want to be able to do that. I want them to be able to run businesses, not jobs. I want them to create environments where they are able to live into their values and their heart-led space and to remember that they are running a business and to make decisions that are both aligned with who they are and what they want their business to do. And that's where my sweet spot is. I don't get really emotional, but I am very compassionate about what they want to do and am able to very easily, very quickly, and with heart, hold up the mirror, yeah, yeah. show the dots that are there, and then connect the dots and see different ways to get to the ultimate goal. Because again, if you're focused on the what and not the how, the how will come. And you can see very clearly if something is a true derailer to your goal, or if it's just a deviation that actually may bring you some more clarity. And that's and if what someone's and if someone's generational trauma mm -hmm. gets in the way of them reaching their goals, then you fall back to the deeper work yes. to to unstick that point so they can absolutely forward. Okay. Absolutely. And I'm always very cautious, you know, for people who are listening, I am not a licensed therapist, right? I'm not a licensed counselor. I'm very careful not to cross that line. And I'm also human and I've seen a lot and been through a lot. And so I take the time very much in the beginning to understand that alignment piece. Who is this person that I'm working with? And then who are they as a leader? And if there are pieces that are not feeling right, usually there's an alignment problem. Mm -hmm. If someone is really unhappy, there's usually an alignment problem between what they want, what they expected and what they got. And so I try to really dig deep beyond the surface of what's uncomfortable for people or what's not making them happy or what is feeling off for them and dig into the why is that? Five whys is my favorite thing, right? I came out of manufacturing. I love the five whys. And so <laughs> digging into that why to get to the aha that says, ah, never thought about it like that. And then it's it's on them. I, I have no judgment. If you want to stay in corporate and that's your thing, we need amazing people in corporate. How do, we, how do I help you do that in a way that you keep from making yourself crazy? You want to build a business? How do I help you do that? You want to sell your business? How do I help you do that? It's not about me. It's about using my genius, my God-given purpose to help and serve the clients that I serve. I'm so reminded of Zig Ziglar, motivational speaker from my era. Oh, yeah, and I love Zig. Yeah, one of the things that he was famous for saying is you can get everything in life you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. But yeah. the hardest thing to know is what they want, especially yes. if they don't know. <laughs> yes, they usually do not. They, they usually, usually do not. Do. Yeah. Yeah. And so in your travels and mm -hmm. in what happens with racial equity and inclusion in the workplace and intersectionality and all the things, what do you see as uh, the biggest challenges to, to young businesses today? You know, I, I think it's young businesses and it's, it's just about everyone right now. I think number one, when you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, Diversity is the easy piece. We can all go out and hire somebody who doesn't look like us, doesn't think like us, all that kind of stuff. That That's easy. That's performative. The equity part gets really emotional, especially right now, societally, because people don't understand the difference between equity and equality, which is a whole different podcast episode, right? So that gets to be the part that be has become really political and is why we're seeing so much of it um, be dashed and departments being broken up and, and dismantled is because people who are afraid of losing power are confusing some out of ignorance, some out of intentionality, confusing ignorance, uh, equality and equity. The piece that's hard is the inclusion part mm -hmm. because the inclusion part means you have to release some control and you have to truly believe that there is value mm -hmm. in the other person or the other person's perspective. And so what I see in smaller businesses 
is there is a much greater capacity for all of those aspects. There is much, much less issue, concern, consternation, people all up in arms in the small businesses I work with because for small businesses, every hire counts. Every dollar spent counts. When you're a Fortune 100, you got those 4,000 people that are at the bottom. It, unless you're really attached to them, you don't really care. If you're at the top, it doesn't really matter, right? Unless you're a really great executive. Mm -hmm. So I don't see a lot of challenge with the fundamentals of D, E, and I in these smaller businesses, just as a, as a function of how they operate and how important the organization, the organization structure and the talent is. Mm -hmm. What I do see is some challenges with these smaller businesses as they go do work with larger businesses. That's where it becomes the issue, especially for women-owned businesses, which is where I focus a lot on, right? They're having the same battles that we had 50 years ago. And it's about being seen, being heard, being deemed to be an expert because the women I work with are experts, not only expert business owners, but they're also experts in their craft. And so overcoming all of the the nuances that are placed upon someone simply because of the package in which they show up. So That's can you give capacity. me an example of what you mean by those nuances? So, so for example, um, I have clients who will go show up with the bigger clients they're going to do work for. Mm -hmm. And even though the CEO is, of this small business is the one that's coming in, they may meet a director. They wow. may meet a maybe a VP that's three or four levels down in the organization. They may not necessarily have access at all, if at any point, to the CEO or COO or anyone in the C-suite because it's a small business or it's a woman-owned business. So they're just a service provider. It's not, it's not worth the time or worth the effort or worth the investment right. simply because they are not seen nearly as expert or or as vital to the process. And that is such a mistake. And while they win a lot of this work and they do exceptional work, what happens most of the time is it has to be the other people they connect to that then push it further up the flagpole, which is very disheartening in this day and age. So it's mostly that. Who do they get access to? So how do they? How do they get access? Do you have to know somebody who knows somebody? Or do you? Right. You know, so... So the reality of the world is, yeah, that network matters. And my clients tend to be master networkers. They know people, um, especially clients I have that are in the design world, the architecture world, things like that. It seems like it's really big, but that's a small world. And they are masters at building and maintaining relationships. So they are really good at ensuring they get exceptional referrals, which get them through a lot of the gauntlet that most people have to run because they've done the work at the front end. And so that's what I really encourage my clients to do. And what I force myself to do as a business owner is build those truly authentic relationships. Authentic meaning, no, I want to know you as a person because I care about people and I'm compassionate about people and I am running a business. So yes, of course, I'm also meeting you because I want us to do business together. So it doesn't mean being... Um, inauthentic when you are very clear that I am building a business relationship here and they are very good at that. And that is what overcomes a lot of the hurdle in kind of getting through the gauntlet. Um, I had one client tell me not too long ago, they said, you know, we meet with all these people, but if we partner with someone or collaborate with someone, sometimes they gatekeep who the real client is, right? So if we're in a collaboration, we don't get to meet directly with the client ourselves. And as we were talking through that, I said, well, that could be a problem. That could also be an opportunity in that as you're doing all your other business development, you know who the client is. Perhaps you meet that client at a different event that has nothing to do with the work that you're doing with them now. There's nothing that says that gatekeeper can't keep you from going to something where this other person happens to be and you introducing yourself and you're not being nefarious. You are being strategic. You are building relationships that matter. 
because that's not going to be the only project that you necessarily want to do with them. And they do need to know you directly and not just through someone else. So those are the kind of things we talk about in terms of being able to overcome some of the hurdles that are simply related to the package in which you show up in. So a little bit of a twist, not much, introverts and extroverts. Because oh. when I think of networking, I think of how I'm an introvert. Yes. Who, who you can't always tell by a podcast yes. and and I use all my words at work and then I come home and I don't have to talk to anybody else for another 18 hours yes. when I would go to network events I used to have to have a strategy to get me to stay in the cocktail hour for 30 yes. minutes you know right. so I you know I went in like an interviewer and said I'm going to talk to three people before I get to go right. home right <laughs> yes but, but when, so when you say master networkers, it's like, I've never been any good at building networks. It's why podcasting works for me. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, you're looking at an introvert, like okay. a very serious introvert. I am professionally extroverted and as they call it ambivert, right? I'm professionally extroverted because I was in HR and I was in consulting with Deloitte, right? So you had to figure out how to be extroverted, but it makes me crazy. There is nothing I hate worse than small talk and chit chat. Can't stand it. It just drains my energy. And I think one of my very first podcasts was called, Yes, You Have to Go to the Party, right? <laughs> and the whole idea was, I would rather pluck out my eyelashes than go to a corporate event. I can't stand it. And so, but I also know, just like with business owners, it is really not about you. It's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. And one of the ways they get to know you is for you to be at the thing. And so I got masterful at, either volunteering to be at the check-in table, that way you get to talk to everybody, but you're sitting, you're not walking the room or getting my tonic, that's the other thing, getting my tonic with lime because they don't know if you're drinking tonic or you're drinking gin. Right. And I would work the room for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, and then I would leave. Mm -hmm. And that bought me about another hour because by the time I worked the whole room and somebody was asking about me, I had another hour of saying, oh, I just saw her, she's over there, right? <laughs> So you have to find the techniques that work for you. And, and I am very fortunate to have incredible women in my circle. And one of them who has her own executive recruiting firm here and, and HR consulting firm here in Houston, we were talking about this because she is extremely introverted as well, but she knows everyone, everyone. She's got to, right? She's recruiting for VPs and CEOs. And I said, I just, I just hate it. And she said, you know, Laurel, I had to change my mindset. This is why I call my podcast, The Rutledge Perspective, right? It's all about perspective. Shift your perspective and shift your circumstances. And she said, I walk into a room and I'm not trying to meet everybody in the room. I walk into the room and say, universe, please let me meet the one person that I can serve. And I'm like, now that I can do, that I can do. I can, that way I don't feel like I have to chit chat with everybody. I don't feel like I have to have a deep, dark conversation with everybody. None of that's necessary. I'm just prepared. I am very prepared to listen, right? Listen actively. Because for me, I've had to turn it around and say, it's not that every conversation is an opportunity to sell. That feels sleazy to me. That helps me bring really bad energy. Um, that old Deloitte energy that sell at any cost. And that's not who I am. But every conversation is an opportunity to serve. And it just so happens that my services are an investment unless I choose to give them away. And so that enables me to walk in, even in my introverted energy, to just go and find that one person. Know that whoever I need to talk to, God is going to send me to the right person. And it has happened every single time, every single time that one person that I needed to talk to or needed to talk to me has shown up every single time. I want okay. to learn more about your ABA model. I sure. want to do that. But okay. I want to talk for a minute about equity and equality. Yes. I know it's another podcast. Give us the, the <laughs> Reader's Digest version because <laughs> this, this might be the only podcast yeah. these people see. Right. It's really big. So there's this really great picture. I love this picture. Yes. Um, and it's these three people standing on this side of a fence. You've probably seen it standing on this side of the fence. So you see them on the other side of the fence. It's like a baseball game. I think that's going on. Yeah. And the three people are three different heights. Yeah. Equality, everybody got a box to stand up, stand on to see the game. Mm -hmm. Still only one of those people could see the game. Yeah. Equity, everyone got 
the box that was the height that enabled them to see the game. That's equity, right? So it's kind of like, the way I like to describe it is, it's the difference between treating people consistently and treating people the same. So if we look at this, consistency is everybody got something. Treating people the same is everybody got a blue pen. So what we want is consistency. What we want is equity, mm -hmm. not equality, because equality doesn't necessarily get you what you need to make the thing happen, right? So that's the way I, de I describe it. And that meme, if you can find, you can probably Google it. It's fantastic. It really I, I can. And in fact, out. I have a resource page at One Voice Evolving. And so when your name comes up for the podcast, it's going to have three resources underneath you recommend. Yeah. And I'll have that picture up there. Yes, because I love I, it, that. It, yeah, it's a game changer. It really mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mm -hmm. really like yeah. that. Yeah. And I think the challenge that we see today between, and, and why I think equity is being pulled so much other than the historical societal stuff that we know. Mm -hmm. um, although I saw something, a quote the other day that was perfect. It said, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it. Those who refuse to teach it intend to repeat it. Mm -hmm. um, and we're having that in Texas, so, and in Florida. Um, but it, I think what what's happening with the, the, the DEI piece, especially here in Texas is, as they say, it's not pie, right? And if someone else gets an opportunity that automatically feels for someone who's never had to work for an opportunity, like their opportunities are gone. And that's simply not the case. There's plenty for everyone. And the reality is everyone that has something now is still not necessarily the right person for that thing. Everyone isn't a fit for everything. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, you might lose something, but you lost something that wasn't yours in the first place. And there's something over here that's amazing waiting for you if you will not be so caught up in what somebody else got or what might have been taken away from you or might have been split up because it was too big in the first place, we can get away from that and just look at how do we do the best and bring the best to the table. I think it starts to at least try to clear up some of that, but it is an emotional topic for sure, mm -hmm. especially right now. Yeah. And so how does your AVA intersect with DEI? So my AVA is really about the individual or the business. So again, alignment, vision, action, whether you're building a business, a career or a life, it's all about that. And, and what is important about the model is, the whole thing is, is critical, but the most important piece is that it starts with alignment. It starts with the root system. And when you look at my model and look at the, the logo of my business, it's a tree. Um, one, if you look at it well, you can see the woman in the tree, right? Can you see her dress and everything? Um, and that's intentional as well. But it starts with the root system because I truly believe that the way trees work are the way we work, if we think about it and how we interact with people. So it starts with a little seed and the roots grow first. And then once the roots get nourished, then you start to see the trunk, which is the vascular system of the tree. Yeah. And then there's branches and leaves or fruit or pine cones or whatever, right, that happen. And I see it as here is the root system that feeds you. What feeds you? The trunk is all of the things that are innately you and how you show up in the world. And then the branches, the flowers, the fruit, all the things are how you want to deliver that to the world. And what's beautiful about that is those things fall off. Leaves fall off, fruit falls off, flowers may be pink this year, they may be yellow next year, and they fall off and go into the ground and they re-nourish the roots. But if you can keep the roots strong, then you're able to do just about anything you want to do. And you are able to understand if something isn't working in your world, where is it off? So I know faith, family, friends, and health. Those are my four. Those are the pieces of my root system. So when my world is not working, one of those four things is off. So I can pause, put my hands up, Laurel, stop. What's not working, right? Have you been on your, doing your meditation? Are you walking in faith? Are you eating and exercising the way you should be? Are, have you been able to engage with your family, right? All of the things that are important to me, that alignment with my clients, whether they are individual coaching clients, whether they are strategy clients, it all starts with who are you and who do you want this business to be? And then what are we trying to accomplish? And I always go back to, okay, here's what you're trying to accomplish. Is that aligned with who you are? Because if it's not happening, it could be that it's misaligned. Then if those two are linked, then we go to action. Because if the action is focused on a vision that is tied to an alignment, then you get flow. 
right? But if all of those things are not aligned, that's when we end up having issues. And so that alignment, when you talk about DEI, it all gets back to really honoring who you are and showing up exactly who you are mm -hmm. all the time in every space, managing your safety, of course, but not, not code switching, not undermining, not having to put on a mask all the time and understanding you're so, so tight and so connected and aligned to who you are that you can then evaluate the space in which you're operating to understand, hmm, this is really where I want to be. It's aligned with who I am, but there's some weirdness going on right now. And I am willing to do what I got to do until I can do what I want to do as long as I'm safe. Or, you know what? Not only does this feel wrong, it feels wrong because it is so not aligned with me. I'm not going to hurt me because I'm mad at them. I'm going to make a plan. But yeah, this is not the place for me. And you're standing in power to be able to do that. And so that that diversity and equity and inclusion piece starts with each individual being very aligned with who they are. So they are able to show up as their whole self and evaluate the organization and how it aligns with them and impact others that are connecting to them within that organization. So to me, it starts with the individual. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you alluded to servants leadership when we started this conversation. And I wonder if you'll play with me for a minute with your sure. tree metaphor. Who are you really? And and what do you have to do to give yourself permission to just be an apple tree, yes. even though you were raised around oranges? Or yes. even though somebody thinks, you know, only citrus is what wants to grow in Florida mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, bloom where you're planted. Mm -hmm. But But we have so many external expectations floating around in yes. there in the vascular yes. system yes that that how do you how do you help people come into peace mm -hmm. with who they authentically are so yes. that they then can present that wherever they are right in that in that moment you know that's a really interesting question i i do a lot of of affirmation and and mirroring right um, to assist people in seeing who they are reflected back to them and then doing the work themselves on being okay with that or deciding what's not okay about that, that they want to change. You know, okay. for example, I know I don't have a poker face. I just don't. Mm -hmm. And at this age, I'm not getting one and I'm not willing to do the work to make that happen. Yeah. But because I know that I am very cognizant of ensuring that the words that I say and the tone that I use don't necessarily reflect the look on my face unless I want it to. Right. And so when I look at that tree metaphor and you talk about oranges or apples, the first time I use my tree metaphor, and I still use it sometimes, it's called, and when I send the tree out to people to get that alignment piece done, it's called, what species is your tree? Mm -hmm. And I talk about, you know, if you're a redwood, you are immovable. That's mm -hmm. great, except when you're wrong. And if you're so immovable when you're wrong, right, what are people going to do? Are you a palm tree that you're great at flexibility, but you're so flexible that people never know which way you're going to go and it doesn't seem like you're decisive, right? So I think that whole idea of really recognizing what kind of tree you are, what kind of fruit you bear, and being so okay with that, Mm -hmm. that you are then able to evaluate the environment in which you're operating objectively and understand, you know what, this is really uncomfortable for me, but my end goal is X, Y, Z, and this is a part of that. And so I'm either going to develop some skills to manage it, or I'm going to figure out how to manage around it. I'm going to figure out how to not be in this department and be in this other department because the organization is where I want to be. It's all about power. When you know you, you stand in power and corporations will make you think you're crazy. They will make you think you can't or you shouldn't or you won't or all of those things. And the reality is that is a difference, but there's a difference between fit and incapable. Mm -hmm. You are absolutely capable. As my friend Holly Dowling says, you don't have to be perfect to be priceless. You're priceless because you exist. Right. Own that and then look at the environmental factors and decide with intention, is this me or is it them? If it's you, then you got to decide if you want to fix it or not. Mm -hmm. If it's them, then you get to decide whether you're going to tolerate it or not. And if you're going to be a catalyst in the organization to change it, because if it's a problem for you, it's probably a problem for somebody else. 
And so for me, being in flow is knowing that I'm an apple tree and my job is just to produce juicy apples. What happens to those after they're produced is none of my business. I don't care because they're nope. going to get used, they're going to get purchased, or they're going to fall to the ground and repopulate yeah. and, and do what they do. And it takes all the stress off of me. Yes. And when people get out of alignment in the workplace, mm -hmm. I see them hoarding their hoarding their fruit. Yes. And that and that breaks trust and communication with entire teams. Yes, immediately. You know, yeah. we we can only be in charge of our actions and our reactions to something. We are not in charge of outcomes. You know, I just had a conversation with a group the other day, and I said we often get caught up in whether or not we got the promotion, whether or not we got the the compensation we wanted or the kudos that we wanted, and we get all in our emotions about that. And sometimes. It has absolutely nothing to do with us. There was another hidden agenda. Yes, biases and unconscious biases are really real and they can be harmful. I would argue that the more treacherous issue is hidden agendas. And the reality is most of the time, the hidden agendas have nothing to do with you. They are not about harming you. They are about helping someone else. And so we have to release our control over the outcomes because those don't have anything to do with us. Those are none of our business. Yeah. Unless it's our business, right? <laughs> yeah. We can't control the outcomes. All we can control is our actions. So as you said, produce, produce those apples, those <laughs> fabulous apples. Be what you're here to do. Yeah. And keep it moving yeah. and keep it moving. So there are, there are two books. Okay. Um, one I keep rereading and I love it. And it's called The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. Somebody's probably talked about that before. Okay. It's amazing. And especially in the construct of your genius, your excellence, right? That, mm -hmm. that's, it's, that's all Gay Hendricks came from him. So that's, that's one I highly recommend. And he's got a really great take on time and how we think of time. Okay. The other one I am reading now, and I even told her, it's going to take me forever to read this book because I keep going back and underlying passages. The book is called Love and Whiskey that was written by Fawn Weaver, mm -hmm. who started and founded Uncle Nearest Whiskey, which is now a unicorn business. Beautiful. She, like, she's my spirit animal. This woman, if I could sit at her feet all day long and just listen to her mm -hmm. and how she's built this business and how strategic she was. And her story is not an easy story at all. Mm -hmm. um, but what she has done and the depth of her faith and the depth of her conviction about why she's here and the legacy she's building and what she intends to do with this business that's beyond her, mm -hmm is is amazing so whether you are an entrepreneur or someone who is leading an organization i think that this book should be in every business school every business school it's incredible and your website is what laurelrutledge.com is my okay. website you know i i would just say the last thing is i really want people especially with the challenge to dei to really pause mm -hmm. and take stock of who they are and the amazing skills and abilities that they bring and know that regardless of what organizations tell you, you always have a choice. Some choices are good and some choices are bad. Some choices are easy and some choices are hard, but you always have a choice. And to not be so angry or so disappointed or so caught up in the organization or the title or any of that stuff, because that is not who you are. That is what you do. And to sit really strong in your own personhood and bring that everywhere you go, because there's someone who is always watching you mm -hmm. and they're seeing how you respond. They are seeing how you're growing. They're seeing how you're overcoming and they need to see that. So it's not always just about you. Just understand that your existence is bigger than you. And to honor yourself, to not let them think you're crazy. And if it's time to go, it's okay. And if you want to stay, it's okay.